Good morning, everyone. Good morning, church. <laughs> I'm Pastor Sean, uh, lead pastor here at West Guilford Baptist, your country church in the heart of Halliburton. Welcome to those watching online next week. This is my wife, Amy. Hi, everyone. I'm Minister of Pastoral Care here. And the better half of our pastoral team. <laughs> Uh, welcome again this morning. We just have a few announcements. Uh, baby bottles, just to remind you, for the Pregnancy Care Center are going to be collected next week. Uh, if you do have some that are filled and you want to return them, just return them to the desk and Holly will put them where, in our secure location that I don't know where they are because I don't like to know where the money is. Uh, we want to say big thanks for the cleanup day. You might have seen some pictures that are there. We had two dozen or more people here, big barbecue. Uh, and a wonderful time. I thought it was a great time of fellowship as well. It so was, thanks it to everybody was. who helped out. Yeah, and uh, my back did pretty good. It did pretty <laughs> it good. Held it, the the it held out for the day. It held out. Amy thought I was crazy. <laughs> uh, some of the things we found, of the things we found during the cleanup, there is a box of old hymnals that Heather's put at the front door there. If you're interested in taking an old hymnal home with you, we kept the best ones there. So uh, please feel free to grab one of those and take them home with you. Uh, our new members meeting, just a reminder, the new members meeting is, uh, is on May, sorry, June 19th. There is a sign up out there. I don't have anybody signed up yet. I did have some people verbally tell me they were interested, uh, but if you please sign up for that. Otherwise, maybe we'll do a Zoom meeting later on in the summer. But for now, uh, the sign up sheet is out there and you were gonna do birthdays and such. There were some birthdays. <laughs> <laughs> Gary Burke's birthday was June 7th, Lynn Cox was June 9th, and Doreen DeGrave was June 10th. I can't see all of those people. Oh, there we go. Yep. <laughs> Happy birthday, everyone. And anniversaries, we have Steve and Brenda Lees. If you're watching online, happy anniversary. That was June 6th. So blessings to all of you. Amen. We're going to worship team up. Yes, worship team, come on up. Let's do some, we'll uh, some praise music. And while they do, let's just invite the Holy Spirit to grip us at the center of our being, Lord God. Come, Holy Spirit, our souls inspire. Enlighten us with your celestial fire, Lord God. Our call to worship is from Romans 5. Therefore, since we've been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we also have obtained access by faith to this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Amen. Stand together and sing. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the
Amen. That'll wake you up. Give thanks to the Lord, our God and King, His love endures forever. For He is good, He is above all things, His love endures forever. Sing praise, sing praise. With a mighty hand and outstretched arm, His love endures Glory to the name of the Lord. 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 Glory to
morning is taken from Acts chapter 24. There are Bibles uh, in the center of each aisle, or sorry, a seating section there if you didn't bring your own Bible. Uh, If you don't have one at home, please feel free to take one of the paper blue Bibles home with you as a gift from us to you. We'll be reading about Paul before Felix at Caesarea from Acts 24. And after five days, the high priest Ananias came down with some of the elders, a spokesman, one Tertullius, and a spokesman, one Tertullius. And they laid before the governor their case against Paul. And when he had been summoned, Tertullus began to accuse him, saying, Since through you we enjoy much peace, and since by your foresight, most excellent Felix, reforms are being made for this nation, in every way and everywhere we accept this with all gratitude. But to detain you no further, I beg you in your kindness to hear us briefly. For we have found this man a plague one who stirs up riots among all the Jews throughout the world and is a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. He even tried to profane the temple, but we seized him. By examining himself, you will be able to find, find out from him about everything which we accuse him. The Jews also joined in the charge, affirming that all these things were so. And when the governor had nodded for him to speak, Paul replied, Knowing that for many years you have been a judge over this nation, I cheerfully make my defense. You can verify that it was not more than 12 days since I went up to worship in Jerusalem, and they did not find me disputing with anyone or stirring up a crowd, either in the temple or in the synagogues or in the city. Neither can they prove to you what they now bring up against me. But this I confess to you, that according to the way which they call the sect, I worship the God of our fathers, believing everything laid down by the law and written in the prophets, having a hope in God which these men themselves accept that there will be a resurrection of both the just and the unjust. So anyway, so always take pain, I always take pains to have a clear conscience both toward God and man. Now after several years, I came to bring alms to my nation to present offerings. While I was doing this, they found me purified in the temple without any crowd or tumult. But some of the Jews from Asia, they ought to be here before you to make an accusation, should they have anything against me. Or else let these men themselves say what wrongdoing they found when I stood before the council, other than this one thing, that I cried out while standing among them, it is with respect to the resurrection of the dead that I am on trial before you this day. But Felix, having a rather accurate knowledge of the way, put them off, saying, when Lysus the tribute comes down, I will decide your case. Then he gave orders to the centurion that he, Paul, should be kept in custody and have some liberty, and that none of his friends should be prevented from attending to his needs. After some days, Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, who was Jewish, and he sent for Paul and heard him speak about the faith in Christ Jesus. As he reasoned about righteousness and self-control and the coming judgment, Felix was alarmed and said, Go away for the present. When I get an opportunity, I will summon you. At the same time, he hoped that money would be given to him by Paul, so he sent for him often and conversed with him. After two years had elapsed, Felix was succeeded by Porcius Festus, and desiring to do the, favor, uh, the Jews a favor, a, say, a favor, Felix left Paul in prison. Let's pray together. Loving Father, we give you thanks for your word. We give you thanks, Lord God, that you call us together freely in such a time, in such a place as this, West Guilford, Lord God, uh, to come together in your holy name, joined together as the body of Christ, Lord God and with one heart praising your name. I give you thanks, Lord God, for the, for the joyful noise that it is, Lord God, when your people get together to worship. It praises you, it gives you glory, Lord God, but it also ministers to our souls. So as we continue in worship, Lord God, we ask and pray that your Holy Spirit would minister to our souls. And as we do, Lord God, we bring up a number of areas of prayer which are of concern to us, Lord God. We continue to pray for Lillian and Sylvia, 
for Joanne and Lori, for Dee and Sharon, for Steph and Ruth. And we also lift up before you, Lord God, the McConnell family as they deal uh, with the loss of Darlene's father, Lord God. We continue to pray for all of our missions partners. And uh, this morning, Lord God, we remember Brody and Deidre. We remember their, uh, their ministry, Lord God, of evangelism, the travels that we see uh, them, them having, Lord, online, uh, the way he's able to uniquely, the two of them are able, able to uniquely connect with those. We pray, Lord God, for more people to come alongside them and support, and we pray for the gospel to go forward, Lord God, and that you would call hearts to yourself through their ministry. Thank you, Lord God, as a small church in the heart of Halliburton, that you give us the opportunity to support such a dynamic ministry and to partner with them, Lord God. We continue also to pray at this time for the wildfires, which are across Canada. They brought up a lot of other cursory issues in our culture, Lord God, but most importantly, we pray for the firefighters, for their protection, Lord God, for their strength, uh, that you would just give them energy and you would keep them safe and bring them home to their families safe after all this is done. We give you thanks for those who are coming from all around the world, Lord God, uh, to help. We just pray, Lord God, for rain and for less wind, and that you would halt the fires, Lord God. And as we pray for our own country, we continue to pray for the world. You are the living God of the entire universe and of our entire globe. We pray for the Sudan. We pray for Ukraine, two, two very complex areas, Lord God. But we know that the, the worst is happening on the ground, and the worst is for those who are most vulnerable and those we pray for. We pray for peace, Lord God, mainly for the little ones, that you would bring about ways of peace in both those areas. We continue to pray for our local community here, Lord God. We pray with the, the closure and the uncertain future of the emergency department in Minden again, Lord God. This is going to impact those who are most vulnerable, those who are most in need. That's where our heart lies as your people, Lord God. Uh, maybe give us a vision for how we can support them. But also, Lord God, we pray that uh, some sort of resolution would come out that would be best for those who are most in need in our community, Lord. We pray, finally, Lord God, for our vision team that's going to be meeting a couple of times this month, Lord God, uh, that we would be able to come forward with something for the deacons to pray with over the summer that will be of you, not of ourselves. And even ahead of time, Lord God, we give you thanks for the vision and the mission of the people here, which is auto it seems like it's automatically drawn towards you. So draw us closer, Lord God, to your heart. And as we are drawn closer, Lord God, forgive us our sins, those that we committed this week sins of omission, things we didn't do, things of commission, things we did, Lord God, which are against your heart and offend you. We pray, Lord God, we come before the cross and we just ask that you would release us from anything that, is spirit, that has been spiritually bound in an unholy way to our lives and to our hearts, Lord God. Release your people, Lord God, to the holiness that you invite them to. And as we receive God's forgiveness, we pray as Jesus taught us, our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Stand together for one more song. Be the 
Time for Kids Church. The kids can go down. <laughs> so there is a battle that rages in the Turner House. It's a ferocious battle that rages in the Turner House. It's been going on for almost two decades, and it revolves around one issue. That issue is this. Which flavor of ice cream should dad buy to make everyone happy? <laughs> Recently, though, I have developed a little trick, and that is when I, I, don't, I don't eat this stuff, just to kind of put it here. I don't eat it, ice cream, it's not my thing. Um, unless it's those haagen bars. I can't say no to those, but that's another thing. Uh, so when I go, I will just go and buy Neapolitan ice cream. And if you aren't happy with one of the three basic flavors, then agree on which one you want and stop abusing me every time I come home with <laughs> Heavenly Hash. Uh, for those who don't know, Neapolitan is the one with the strawberry, the, the chocolate, and the vanilla. I think everybody knows what, what Neapolitan ice cream is. Uh, when in the, I don't know if you knew this, so in the mid-1800s, when Neapolitan ice cream came to America by way of Naples, hence the name Neapolitan, when it came here from Naples, uh, it was actually the flavors of pistachio, vanilla, and cherry. Can anyone guess why it would be pistachio, vanilla, and cherry? The Italian flag, Lori. There you go. Right on there. I didn't think anyone was going to get that. She knows her ice cream. She knows her ice cream. And I, I, eventually, our present form became standard, basically because chocolate, vanilla, and, and strawberry are the most liked flavors in North America. Now, I mention this because the popularity of this kind of ice cream, for going on about 200 years now, for 200 years, this has been, think of any product that's lasted that long in North America and stayed the same, okay? The popularity of that product says something about us as humans. It says something about how variety speaks to us as a people. We even think about God's word, right? The variety, amazing voices that you get all the way from Genesis through the, the, uh, the Psalms, the prophets into the Gospels and through the New Testament. We have all these different genres of history, testimony, prophecy, and poetry. Through all these things, the living God speaks. He knows how to speak to his people. And what a wonderful gift it is for us here at West Guilford Baptist, this little country church, to have Pastor Brian able to lead a service for us on a regular basis. Um, along with our mission partners, we, in, we endeavor to be an 80-20 church. What does that mean? It means the lead pastor gets to speak. You know, get, I get the pulpit 80% of the time. But 20% of the time, we want a different voice. We want someone else to come up and speak and give a different perspective. Eugene Peterson used to say, to tell it slant, to come at it from a different angle, because it's extremely important. Uh, Brian and I are very different. <laughs> and that is very good that we are different. I don't know about you, but Brian, it was like a breath of fresh air for me to be able to come in and hear you preach, brother. So I do appreciate you. Fresh spirit because it gives a different perspective. As we look at the book of Acts, it really has been, if we think about it, a succession of different voices. Luke is telling the story, but through Luke, there's been this succession of voices. We started out with Jesus when he gave his commission. Then it moved through, I'm, I'm having the names written down here, moved through Stephen, then we heard from Peter, then we heard from Philip, 
Then we heard from James as the, God, as the Spirit pushed the church out of Jerusalem. Then we heard we had Paul pick up the baton, and he goes way out there. But when he goes out way out, way out there, what does he find? He finds the Spirit's already there. And Apollos is already out there. And, and Priscilla and Aquila, because the Holy Spirit beat him there. And as we come together, we're at the beginning of the end of our series now on Acts. It's almost been a year since we've been preaching through Acts. So we're coming up on a year since we've been preaching through Acts. And I want to start to tie all of these different voices together. Because as we tie all these different voices together, they really give us a strong challenge both for our ministry and for our life. And today's big idea, what's the big idea? Today's big idea is this. Freedom is found in Jesus when we root our identity in him. Far be it for us as a church, or far be it as us, for us if we were as individuals, if we were to root our identity in anything but Jesus. When we do root ourselves, and this is what we're going to talk about, when we do root ourselves in anything but Jesus, we, become, we actually naturally get into bondage to those things. We want, to, we want to see everything through Jesus, not instead of Jesus. And so what, as we look at Acts 24, what I saw as I prayed and studied through the passage this week was a stark contrast between two characters. So you're going to want to open up to Acts 24, open it up on your phone if you want there. And I saw it was these two characters of Paul and Felix. And what we're going to see is that although Paul is the one who's under house arrest, the real prisoner in our story is Felix. And Luke tells the story in such a way that gives us that sense. So what does it say? We look at verse 1, where we ended two weeks ago, is where we start. Take us to our next slide. Paul is, basically ends up with a five-day vacation in the king's, in the king's uh, palace. Right, a far cry, we talked about this a couple weeks ago, it's a far cry from the prison that he was in in Jerusalem. This is, this is the foundation of what the king's palace, uh, Herod's palace at that time, that was the view that Paul had. So he sat there for five days under house arrest, in the king's palace, and waited for the chief priest and his entourage to come down from Jerusalem. Now, the fact that Ananias himself left the city and came all the way down to Caesarea shows how important this was. The, the chief priest doesn't leave, the, doesn't leave the city that often at all. And so he himself comes down, and he brings with him this lawyer, Tertullus. Now, Tertullus was probably given by his name, a Gentile, with some sort of link to the council. We don't know if he, was a, if he was a God-fearer. What we do know is this was a very big deal for Tertullus. Like, this is like going to The Hague or the, the Supreme Court as a, as a lawyer, right? This is, this is his moment to go right up in front of the governor and, and, uh, and, and give, give an account and be a lawyer and show himself off. But if we look from verses 2 to 9, unfortunately for Tertullus, pretty much everything he's been given to say is a complete lie. Imagine that being, this being your first, your first case that you get to say, or a case you get to say in front of the governor, and then you're like, this is what you want me to say? And so he goes up in front of, of Felix, and, and it starts with the blatant flattery of the governor. Right off the bat, friends, if we're, if we're Luke's, Luke's audience, and we start hearing Tertullus say this to, to, uh, to Felix, we know that he's lying. Okay, because if we think about, uh, we, we, I want to think for just a second about uh, Felix. What we, here's what we know about Marcus Antonius Felix. This is the guy who Luke contrasts with Paul. Um, he was the governor of Judea for about seven years. He was a former freed slave. So you think about, he made his way all the way up from being a freed slave all the way up to the top levels. And he was known really for two things. And we know this outside of the Bible. Felix was known for two things being corrupt, and being brutal to his enemies. History makes note of him because he was so cruel. He actually gets, will end up getting repatriated to Rome because things got so bad and he was being such a bad guy. He, get, he got brought back to Rome. So the only true thing this lawyer actually says in this entire passage is found in verse Five, when he says, for we found this man, one who stirs up riots among all the Jews throughout the world as a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. That's the only thing, true thing he said. He's a leading Christian. Everything else is complete bunk. So Paul is a very smart guy. We've already talked about this. Yeah, he's a, he's a rough worker. He works with, with leather, but he was also a scholar. So it's actually a pretty easy uh, defense that he made. 
The only thing that he is accused of that the Romans would actually care about is in that verse that I just read, in verse 5, and it is that word, riots. That was a very, very bad thing. If you were someone who was stirring up riots in Rome at that time, in any Roman province, uh, that was death at that time. Being found guilty of sedition meant death in ancient Rome. This was the law there. So basically, it was treason. So that's what Paul really has to deal with, because if, if, he, if, they, if they show that he's stirring up riots and he's guilty of treason, then it's off with his head. Actually, he's probably going to hang from a cross, but you know, he's going to be dead. That's what's going to happen to him. So Paul. So then we get Paul first in verses 10 to 13. The first thing he does is that he points out he was only in Jerusalem for 12 days before he was, right, he was uh, arrested. And he wasn't there stirring anybody up or arguing with anybody during that time. In fact, they came upon him uh, in spite of the fact that he was in the temple and he had been cleansed himself and was just like giving alms and things like that. That 12 days, not enough time to start a riot. He's like, everybody knows I was just there for 12 days. How am I going to get all these people around me if I spend 12 days just in the temple praying? So, and then after that, he's pointing out he didn't have enough time to start an insurrection. Then he does something that is actually brilliant. And if we start, we look at verse 15 in the passage. It says this, it says, Having a hope in God, which these men, these men themselves accept, that there will be a resurrection of both the just and the unjust. Kind of seems, well, what is it that brilliant that he's doing there? Felix, it says, has an, a knowledge of the way. We also learn in this passage he has a Jewish wife. He was undoubtedly aware of the division between the Pharisees and the Sadducees. At this point, he was governor for about four to five years. And what was, we've talked about it the last two times I've preached, what was the main difference, theological difference, there's a lot of them, but what was the main one between the Sadducees and the Pharisees? Their, brief, their belief in the resurrection right? So Paul brings that up there. This was a cause, and Felix undoubtedly would, know, would have known this was the cause of a lot of friction for the ruling council in Jerusalem. So having defended himself against serious charges, Paul is trying to frame hit this whole case as a simple disagreement about a, a, a particular religious issue, something Felix doesn't care about at all. He deals with Paul, what, what Felix really, really is concerned with, and then just says, Felix, this has this has to do with, with a question of our theology. And that's why they brought, they brought us here. I told them they could leave these here, maybe. I... <laughs> he makes it, and we can see in verse 21, he, it, almost like an exclamation point, he makes it plain that his cry about the resurrection, which everybody in the temple heard, is the real issue. He also points out, just as an add-on to that, that his real accusers weren't present. We see that in verse 19. That actually meant this was a mistrial. If you're going to accuse someone of something, you have to be there in front of the magistrate in order to accuse them. You can't do it just through Tertullus or through a, a lawyer. So it was actually going to be a mistrial. So, I mean, Paul just blows it apart. This poor Tertullus <laughs> standing there before Felix the governor just watching it all fall apart. And he had to know beforehand. He's like, this is not going to go well for me. Anyway, so, so uh, Felix dismisses the trial, we see in verses 22 and 23, for now, and Paul is placed under free custody in the palace on the shoreline, you know, watching the, watching the, the birds and the, 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 uh, the sail ships go by. And this is where things, if we look from 24 on, get very interesting to me. Things get very, because there's a change, there's a turnaround that happens here that Luke does for us which makes this contrast between Felix and between, Paul, and between Paul, because Felix is curious, and he calls Paul. Felix has a Jewish wife, it says, which gives him a deeper understanding of the issues, but we have to remember, again, he's not a great guy. Felix is not a great guy. So although he's curious about the faith, he's also very interested in money. So these two things come together. And according to uh, Luke's color of the character of Felix, uh, adding to that, uh, Luke very purposely brings up Drusilla, his wife. Because Luke's readers, again, if we put ourselves back into that time, the people who Luke is writing for, they would have known who this individual was. Drusilla was the youngest daughter of Herod Agrippa. Remember we talked about the Herodic family? This was the grandson, Herod, the last of them. She was his daughter, so he was the puppet king of Palestine at that time. 
And so she had been married to King Azizus of Syria. So Syria, she was married, so her dad was the puppet king here, and she was married off as the youngest daughter, and this is what would happen, to the king of Syria up here. Everybody would have known who she was, right? She was the, the queen up there. But Fe Felix, when he divorced his own wife, convinced her to leave her husband and then come and marry him down here in, C in, in Caesarea. Right. That was a scandal. That would have been everybody, you know, if, if there was the National Enquirer, I guess the, you know, the, the Jerusalem Enquirer, the two of them are on the front page of that, right? Like this was a scandal that went on. So, so Luke brings her up and says, you know, just to remind us, not a great guy. Convinced her to leave her husband and come to marry him. Both uh, are known outside of the Bible. For instance, we know that she died in the same eruption of Mount, Mount Vesuvius that destroyed Pompeii. Uh, details of the couple would have been known to Luke's audience. And the reason we also we know it's known is because they're written down somewhere. They didn't write stuff down that didn't matter. So to the people of that time, these two people mattered. But as John MacArthur point out, um, it's important for us to understand because with Felix's own life and morals, he is alarmed at Paul's discussion of his faith. Paul's talking about morals, he's talking about righteousness, he's talking about faith in Jesus, and you think about who you are as Felix, you're, con you're curious about this weird guy, but also at some, he becomes alarmed and he puts him off. John MacArthur points out at that point, in that moment when, when Paul is preaching to him and he becomes alarmed, the Luke starts, or sorry, Luke starts the passage out with Paul being tried by Felix, but it ends up as a trial of Felix before Paul. And Felix does not come off well. He's alarmed, he's shocked, he's dismayed. And further as we read on, God uses his, uh, Felix's curiosity as well as his corruption. God uses everything to keep Paul coming back and preaching the gospel to him over and over and over again. We see that in verse 26. Unfortunately for Felix, he's so caught up in the layers of sin. He's so caught up in the layers of power and of intrigue that he's woven about himself. He just keeps putting Paul off. Later. I'll deal with Jesus later. There's important things going on, don't you know? I can't deal with this now. How often does that happen in life? Later. I'll deal with it later. But eventually, the passage says, another governor comes in. What we know from history is that things had got so bad under Felix, the Jewish leaders appealed to Rome and basically in a, in a letter and said, this is what's going on here. So Rome was like, yeah, that can't happen. Brings Felix back. And when you, when you, when you think about the fact that it's the Jewish leaders who are going to be accusing Paul, or sorry, accusing Felix before the, the, the people in Rome, before the, the leaders in Rome, this is why Felix wants to curry favor and keeps Paul in prison. It's not just a favor because he's a nice guy. He's hoping keeping Paul in prison is going to have, maybe, maybe they'll go a little easier on me in Rome when I go there and I have to stand before the leaders in Rome. Again, not a great guy. He doesn't do anything out of the good of his, goodness of his heart. His own sin eventually caught up with him. Felix is a man trapped in his own spiritual bondage. While Paul's in, physically, in, in physical custody, is spiritually free. In fact, he chooses physical custody because he, he feels like that's how God's going to glorify himself. Paul is free, while Felix is the one that's in change. Paul wrote about freedom in Christ just before this. He wrote the book of Romans, we believe, just before this instance, and this is what he wrote in the book of Romans, Romans 8.15. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery, of bondage, to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. Friends, an essential joy, an essential element of our joy as Christians is the living the freedom that we have in Jesus. An essential element of your joy is the freedom you have in Jesus. Jesus was talking about his teaching in the Gospel of John, and he said this, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Now, of course, the, the, the freedom that Jesus is talking about is the freedom from sin and from bondage, but let's turn it on its head here. Just for a moment, let's turn this on its head. This is freedom for holiness. 
you have been freed to holiness, to the life that God has for you. And this matters because through Jesus, God's demands for holiness become an invitation. There is now no more condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. It is an invitation for holiness. Those outside, for like Felix, God's calls for holiness are a condemnation. There's something to fear. There's something to put off. But in Jesus, they're an invitation. God's demands are an invitation. God's call to be holy is a source of joy for us, friends, rather than a source of fear. Is God's call for holiness a source of joy for you, or is it a source of fear? Remember this week, there is no condemnation. The call is for life and freedom, rather than the source of fear as it was for Felix. And just as an aside, Felix, is, is, as a protagonist in our story, he's not someone we're supposed to hate. Felix is a sad individual we're supposed to have compassion for. He's very sad. Well, we thank God for calling us and for the word which breaks the power of counterfeit pleasures. The truth will set you free. Knowing the truth means knowing the living God as he truly is, knowing God as Jesus showed him to be, knowing with our hearts and our minds and our actions. So it's a head knowing, but it's a heart knowing. Paul's heart is is free. He knows the living God. And in knowing the living God, we are made free. And we see for Paul, this was not a philosophical idea. This was something he lived. No matter what was going on, no matter where he ended up, it was intensely practical, and it was intensely practical when it mattered the most. It allowed Paul to live and experience God's glory, but also show God's glory for all to see in contrast to this sad little man called Felix. And that leaves us with a challenge. John Calvin once wrote that truth and wisdom consist of two things. Truth and wisdom consist of two things. Knowledge of God, but also knowledge of ourselves. When we say knowledge of ourselves, it's just like the knowledge of God. It's a head thing, but it's also a heart thing. God wants us to know our hearts. And it's very sad because many go to their graves. I've known many people, maybe you do too, who've gone to their graves not really knowing themselves. Their lives have been determined by others. Their lives have been determined by other things, other people, other substances. They've never really truly known who they are and who they are before the living God, that freedom. As I say spiritual bondage, that's what I mean. No matter who you are, God has an identity for you of freedom. So when I say the word spiritual bondage, I wonder if something comes to mind for you. Something that was supposed to bring you joy, but really just became a controlling factor. Stealing your freedom. Stealing your joy. In my family, we have a history of addiction. There's a big one. But maybe it's a life-stealing pattern of thought there was a time when I personally had to accept I was more angry than I should be. That's not the life that God wanted for me. It took a lot of work, a lot of people coming alongside, but it started with knowledge of myself before God and being honest with myself. I'm too angry. Help me, Lord. Maybe it's an expectation for your life that isn't from God or godly, but you've been living out of this expectation from your past or this worldly expectation. Whatever it is, I mean, if, there, if I asked people in here, there's probably as many different things as there are people in this room. That's for, between you and God. Whatever it is, we know that what continues to have a hold on us, and if we're honest before the loving Father about what that is, that is an important step to freedom. One of the saddest things for me as a parent is when my kids feel like they can't share a hurt with me. God is your loving Father. Don't try to hide it from Him. Open it up for Him. Because I, I know me as a sinful parent, I help my kids. God wants to help you. God wants to walk with you in the places that matter most in your life. So bring it before Him because He cares for you.
If you're in Jesus, you are a part of God's family. You are adopted. This is a theme that has come up over and over again in this church with a number of you when we've spoken just about this power of being adopted by the living God. And you can be honest with your besetting sins before God. That's what these are, these things that hold us. There are besetting sins. Not only can you, but it is an important step, friends. We should do that. An important step to mature in healthy faith based on a true understanding of God as our Father and of ourselves as His children. So what is it? You can bring it to the cross. Let's pray. As I invite the uh, ushers to go down and get the kids. Loving Father, at this moment, at this time, I believe each and every person here has something that we can come and, and bring before you, Lord God. We call it repentance. We call it saying sorry. We're going to come to you as children, Lord God, just holding these things up to you, just in this very moment. Hold it up in your spirit to God, this thing that, that has had too much of a hold on you. Help me, Lord God. Whatever it is, Lord God, take it. Renew it. Wash it clean, Lord God. And bring us, every one of us, into a deeper knowledge and a deeper understanding of ourselves as your children loved, understood to the depths of our being, and raised to a new life that carries on to eternity through the power of the cross. Thank you, Lord God. So for our big finish, as the kids come up, uh, we, before the Berlin Wall fell, uh, those on the eastern side who wanted to defect had a very long journey that they needed to take. Even though you could see through the wall and through the, the, uh, the barbed wire to where people were, were biking freely, you couldn't just go there. If you wanted to defect, you had to take a very long trip. You had to first go to Hungary, then you had to sneak through Austria, and then finally sneak all the way back to the west in order just to get to eye shot of where you started. Even though it was, what, 30 feet? 40 feet, maybe less, you had to take that long trip to get there. There was no shortcut to get to the other side of the fence. The way to spiritual freedom placed before us, friends, is the cross. There's no shortcut. The power that holds us is simply too strong, but God is stronger, and the cross is stronger. So whether it's for the first time or the thousandth time, when we look at our lives, honestly, we do so at the foot of the cross of Jesus, confident in the power of God to bring life and the freedom that you crave and I crave. If there's something that's on your heart right now that's come up through this sermon or come up through while we're worshiping, there's going to be prayer after the service at the back there. Uh, maybe some of us will hang out around here and have prayer in here if anybody wants it. We'd love to pray with you uh, and pray together. And, and, but a warning, when West Guilford Baptist Church prays, things tend to happen. Amen? I'll welcome the worship team up and they'll take us home with some songs. Good sermon, babe. <laughs> Let's stand and sing together. <laughs>
thank you for the cross, Lord God, that breaks us free of every bond. We thank you for the cross, Lord God, that not only saves us, but's going to carry us home. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. God bless. Have a great week, everyone.